Okay, well, it's a very special day uh, for me as uh, Noelle's advisor to be able to introduce her uh, for her finishing talk. Uh, it's always, you know, there's sort of an emotional feeling about um, introducing students as they finish. It's a big event, and uh, we're very uh, proud of, of, uh, of her. Noelle got her bachelor's from Smith College, uh, and while she was an undergraduate, she did a summer internship at the Cal Academy. She then came to my lab as a research technician, uh, and then uh, moved with me uh, from Arizona, when I, that was when I was at Arizona, and then moved with me from Arizona uh, to Berkeley. Uh, and she was tremendously helpful uh, during, during that move. Um, so Noelle's research, I want to say a little bit about her research teaching, and then uh, just some comments about her as a lab citizen and, and colleague. Uh, her research is, is really beautiful. It's, it's diverse. So it's included field work uh, in a number of different places. It's included uh, experimental studies in the lab. Uh, it's uh, with uh, captive mouse populations, house mouse populations. Uh, it's included laboratory work and genomics. So it's really spanned a whole range of different approaches. Uh, she's worked on, it's taxonomically broad, and she's worked on both model and non-model organisms. And, and so I really appreciate this sort of breadth of thinking she's uh, brought to bear on uh, the problem she's been interested in, which is how organisms uh, live in the desert, how they adapt to, uh, and in particular mammals, how they adapt to living in conditions without free water. Uh, and it's really an example of a larger problem in evolutionary biology, which is how do organisms adapt uh, to uh, conditions uh, where selection is really on traits that are, that are complicated, that are polygenic, that are not simple Mendelian traits. Uh, so that's a, a little bit about the, uh, the, the research. Um, I think it, it really tackles fundamental questions. Uh, for her work, she's received an NSF DDIG award when they existed. <laughs> uh, and she's also received funding from the Society for the Study of Evolution. Uh, so she'll tell you more about uh, her research today. Her thesis has three chapters. Um, her teaching has also been uh, exemplary. She has taught, um, she may not be proud of this, but she's taught almost every semester, in fact, every semester except this semester uh, that she's, she's been here, so for six years. Uh, she's taught in, in 104, um, I guess a few times, four times, yeah. And uh, I just want to say I have heard independently from all of the instructors in 104 about what a fantastic GSI she's been. She brings a sort of contagious enthusiasm uh, uh, to her, um, uh, her work and her teaching and appreciation of, of animals in, in nature. So she's gotten rave uh, reviews uh, for teaching. Um, as a lab citizen, she's been uh, incredibly important, uh, important to me personally. Uh, she's warm, she's gracious, she's been kind of uh, the social glue in the lab. So among other things, she's organized every year uh, a lab uh, Thanksgiving uh, <coughs> party where everybody gets together uh, for, for Thanksgiving. I've never been invited, but I hear it. <laughs> 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 uh, and so that's been great. As a colleague, I, I just want to say uh, a, a couple of things. Noelle is very smart and she's very insightful. So in lab meetings, I've, I've noticed over the years, sometimes when we're talking about things that are far from her own res research, she asks, you know, the critical question that sort of helps move the thinking in the group uh, forward. And so I've, I've really appreciated that. So um, I'm not going to go on and on, but I can't end without making two observations that I think are, are very important. Um, the first is, and probably many of you know this, Noelle is a, is a great cook. And in, in particular, she's a great dessert chef. Uh, and so she has, without fail, kept track of everybody's birthday in the lab over the years. And every single uh, time there's a birthday, she bakes some amazing cake or whatever and, and brings it in. It's, it's spectacular. She's the best dessert cook I know. Don't tell my wife. <laughs> But it, it, she's very good. The second observation I want to make uh, is that she's been with me for a while now. Uh, so I have here a, a copy of Noelle's CV. Um, and uh, this is from when she first arrived here uh, in 2013. And it has her expected graduation date uh, of, for her PhD of May 2017. 
So uh, here we are in uh, 2019. Uh, so she, she's, she's been with me for a while. And those two observations, that she's a great cook and she's been here a while, turn out to be related. And, and I didn't know this until I stumbled across an article in the New York Times about Noel last year. <laughs> and so I'm going to have to quote from the New York Times. It turns out Noel started this... Uh, now, any advisor, of course, would be proud to have their student written up in the New York Times. <laughs> you probably knew this was coming. <laughs> uh, Noel started uh, a thanks or a holiday food swap uh, that is uh, arranges for people to, to send uh, dessert gifts and holiday food uh, to each other, and it's a big deal. I mean, it's big enough so it's in the New York Times. And in, in the article, it says the Food Fifty Two swap started as a procrastination project for Noel Bigger, <laughs> who was studying evolutionary biology. Um, to avoid studying, Miss Bidner would blah, 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 blah. It, 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 it went on. Uh, but I, you know, there were some things in this, this article that, that really made me feel very good about Noel. Uh, that made me feel good, but it, it goes on and, and says, the exchange has grown so big, she has added spreadsheets and written software to coordinate the pairings. So when I learned she was writing software, I thought, that's fine, she can handle any genome. <laughs> so uh, it's been just a, a joy to have Noelle in the, in the lab, uh, and we're going to miss her. Uh, uh, immediately after the seminar, uh, we're going to have some bubbly and, and cake to which everybody is uh, invited. And uh, if you didn't have enough cake at, at uh, coffee this morning w with Christina. So with that, I will turn it over to, to Noel. Thank you, Michael, for that sort of embarrassing introduction. Uh, Sign-ups for the cookie swap have ended this year, but next year you can join. It will be the 10th year. All right, so I'm going to talk to you today about my thesis, the work that I've been doing here at Berkeley, and it all sort of focuses on the genomic basis of desert adaptation in rodents, as Michael said. And in the past 20 or so years, we've gone from understanding the genetic basis to basically no adaptive traits in nature, to understanding the adaptive basis of, or the genetic basis of many uh, traits in nature. But almost all of these are traits that are Mendelian in nature. So they're inherited in a simple fashion, and they're either uh, controlled by a single gene or just a few genes. And here are just a few good examples of that. Of course, the rock pocket mouse, which has been studied extensively in our lab, in which color variation is associated with habitat type. Dark mice live on dark rocks, light mice live on light rocks, and one gene, at least in this population, MC1R, has four chart-changing amino acid substitutions that mediate this color variation. And you might remember from my first MVZ retreat talk that I was really focused on this system. That didn't work out so well, but <laughs> desert adaptation now. Another great example of this is EDA in uh, three signed sigilbacks where, this gene, where uh, alleles in this gene mediate a huge portion of phenotypic variation in armament in these fish. But we know that the vast majority of evolution is not on these simple traits, but on complex traits. And complex traits are traits where they're polygenic, many genes mediate the phenotype, and they also have some environmental component, which also mediates the phenotype. And so getting at the genetic basis of, trait, trait, of these traits has been really challenging. And one way that people have thought about this is asking about recurrent evolution to a similar environment and whether or not similar genes mediate changes in this uh, capacity. So beautiful work being done in sticklebacks of, um, of invasion of uh, freshwater environments, as well as in uh, marine mammals, invasion of marine environments, have really uh, started getting at this question of how do we understand the genetic basis of complex traits. And so I'm going to focus on this question in deserts, where there are some major selection pressures, since, such as uh, high and really variable temperatures, low to seasonally absent water, and also the effect of UV on organisms. And I'm going to focus uh, specifically in the rest of my talk on this, uh, this problem of what do you do when you don't have a lot of water. So my thesis has looked at this on three scales. The first is over 70 million years of rodent evolution, looking at rodent specialists that are um, recurrently adapted to desert environments. The second is looking 
very recently, in the past about 200 years of evolution, in an invasive mouse, the house mouse, that's invaded um, the Sonoran Desert, and looking at plastic and evolved responses to water stress in this. And then the third chapter I'm not going to talk about today, but I've um, worked on providing a reference of a, the genome of a desert specialist, the rock pocket mouse. So to start at the beginning, 70 million years of evolution, um, to sort of set up this problem, I want to talk to you about uh, water usage. I'm going to say the word mammal and rodent interchangeably, but I'm thinking here about rodents. So all organisms need water to survive. They need it for salt and water, water homeostasis to thrive and keep the body um, homeostasis. Uh, and there's three sort of major ways that water goes into a mammal system. The first is metabolic water through food. So the breakdown of starch molecules mainly leads, gives off a few molecules of water. The second is preformed water in food, which you're familiar with if you've ever eaten celery or lettuce. You're getting some water out of that. And the third is through free drinking water. And the relative proportions of this input are really different across different mammals. So we drink a lot of water proportional to the amount of metabolic water that we use. But in things like kangaroo rats, the vast majority of the water that they use is through this metabolic water, a little bit of preformed water in food. And the, most of them won't even drink water if you offer this to them. And so the relative proportion of this can be really different. Uh, there are a few major mechanisms of water loss. The first is really obviously through urine, also feces. Evaporative water loss, which in rodents is less about um, sweating as it is in us, and more about uh, losing it through breathing. And then saliva. And of course in females, lactation is a major route of water loss. So you can imagine in a desert there's not many ways to increase water gain into a system, but there are a lot of ways to mitigate water loss in a system. And desert rodents have evolved a few interesting behavioral and morphological adaptations to mitigate water loss. This is just a few examples. Here, um, this is a Spinifex hopping mouse in which, uh, like many other desert rodents, in addition to being nocturnal, they burrow. And so burrowing, you can imagine, is a much higher humidity environment, so you lose a, less, a lot less through evaporative water loss. And specifically, these mice tend to den communally, so you increase uh, uh, humidity even more by all those mice breathing in a burrow together uh, and decrease evaporative water loss. Second is, you're not used to looking at mammal skulls. This might be, not be as striking to you, but this is a kangaroo rat skull, which has an incredibly long rostrum and long nasal bones. Long rostrums are often associated with deserts, and this is um, in order to cool air as it's leaving the body. Uh, air is at 100% humidity at the lungs when you're exchanging oxygen, but you don't want to lose that 100% humid air if you're trying to mitigate water loss. And so by increasing the surface area through t things like turbinate bones and increasing the distance that air travels, you give it more chance to cool down and thus uh, reduce uh, the water concentration of the air you're breathing out. And then, of course, a big thing that's modified is the excretory system, of which the kidney is sort of the focus of that. And uh, we're going to be talking more about the kidney moving forward. So to sort of motivate my thinking on this, um, Look, choosing which rodents I want to study. Um, I, I accumulated, this is data accumulated by Beauchat, and I plotted this data that is urine concentration, which is a uh, proxy for sort of kidney function more generally, and this is across all of the mammal orders you can see up here. And I want you to take two things away from this. The first is that far and away, <coughs> the rodents have the highest urine concentration, and this has a lot to do with their size. Um, there are some other great desert animals here, the fennec fox within the carnivora, and the camel within the sedartiodactyla, and they have much lower uh, urine concentrations, although they're much higher than other uh, examples in their order. As an aside, who knows what this high urine concentration bat is? The vampire bat? Vampire bat, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you're consuming a lot of extra solutes, you got to get rid of them somehow. Um, so, so that's the first thing I want you to take away is that urines are all have met as that high concentration in urine is in mostly the rodents. Then if you look across the rodent tree, you'll see that of these high urine concentration rodents, that it's not just a sim single phylogenetic clade. And in fact, high urine concentration is distributed all across rodents. And so this sort of sets up my problem. If you take rodents from three families that have high urine concentration, can we compare these um, to identify genes involved in desert adaptation? So of course I've used 
This top row in here, the Spinifex hopping mouse, known as Alexis. I've looked at Ketodipus intermedius, the rough pocket mouse, which I've studied <coughs> in the lab for decades. And then uh, the uh, Jerboa, Jaculus, Jaculus. And so to set up the problem more explicitly, can we use patterns of molecular expression evolution to help identify genes underlying uh, desert adaptation? And first I'm going to look at whether or not there are genes specifically under selection. Second, I'm going to look at genes in which they, uh, there's convergence at the expression level between desert and non-desert species. And third, I'm going to ask whether or not there are any genes that overlap by these two methods. So you don't just want to compare desert uh, species across 70 million years of evolution. Instead, what I've done here is taken a paired approach where I'm comparing a desert specialist with a non-desert representative for all three of these families. And this allows me to compare phylogenetically independent comparisons of desert specialization. Um, and I've also used desert, uh, mice, sorry, desert rodents from all over the world. So within the first family, the Heteromyidae, of course, I'm looking at the rock pocket mouse that I collected right side outside of Tucson, Arizona. These are great desert mice. Even if you give them water, they won't drink it. They're uh, almost fully granivorous rodents. And a lot of work has been done um, on related species in uh, kidney uh, morphology and such. And then I'm comparing this with one of the very few tropical representatives of the Heteromyidae, Desmarus spiny mouse, um, Heteromys desmarus dianus, and this is collected for me by B. Jimenez in Chiapas. The second comparison is within the Dip Dipotidae. Uh, this is the lesser Egyptian Derboa, which has been studied extensively for uh, desert and kidney morphology, and also for uh, all sorts of cool development in their limbs, these crazy limbs here. Um, and this is the only, these are the only samples that are, were captive. So these are from uh, Kim Cooper at UCSD. And I've compared this with the western jumping mouse that I collected up at Sage Hen. These are riparian animals to the extreme. <coughs> Patton told me basically to have one foot in the stream and one foot on land and set a trap line right <laughs> along the creek. And that is where I found them. They're also very cute swimmers. Um, <coughs> And the third comparison is, again, the, the rodent with highest urine concentration, the Spinifex hopping mouse, which is collected for me by Kevin Rowe and colleagues, collected in general, by Kevin Rowe and colleagues in Australia. And I've compared this with our local house mouse. These are mice collected from Golden <coughs> Gate Fields, from the Oakland Zoo, and from Urban Ore. If you're wondering about local house mouse genetics. <laughs> and for all of these, I collected kidneys from five adult males to the best of my ability. Since we want to look at both sequence variation and expression level variation, I extracted RNA um, to do RNA-seq. Because I've set up these samples, they were standardized by chaos, being shipped from all over the world. There were some very low RIN scores. This is a measure of RNA integrity. Um, there are some, some of them were as high as 9, but some of them were as low as 3 or 5. And so I used a ribodepletion protocol in order to try to try my best to get these samples. And it worked, so that's great. Um, and then I took two approaches. The first is I needed to assemble de novo transcriptomes for all, almost all of these species. We didn't have kidney transcriptomes from anything except for uh, the house mouse. So to do that, I sequenced that to a, appropriate depth and took these transcriptomes for tests for selection. But I also used them to map breeds for expression to additional four individuals that I um, sequenced <coughs> to a much lower depth. And then I was able to analyze differential expression there. So I'm going to talk to you first about this component and second about this component. So to identify genes under selection, like I said, I had to first assemble transcriptomes. So I quality and adaptive trimmed these with trim galore. I error corrected them with R corrector, and then I assembled them with Trinity. Since these are outbred wild mice, the influence of alleles is or alternate alleles is strong, and so I reduced in at a temperature to get out allelic versus paralogous variation. I reduced the complexity of the transcriptomes with CD hit at a 95%. Um, <coughs> Um, <laughs> and uh, which was pretty helpful. And so here are just some basic assembly stats on the number of contigs, the contig N50, and then the number of annotated transcripts tra uh, annotated to mouse in all of my uh, transcriptomes. Another sort of benchmarker for uh, transcriptome quality is this Fusco, which looks at the presence of 6,192 single copy orthologs that are found across all our contig layers in my data set. Um, and I'm getting, a, I got around 80-ish percent for almost all of the species transcriptomes that I assembled. 
so that's great. Uh, you don't expect 100% in this situation because it's a kidney expression, so that so not all genes that are expressed at different developmental stages or in different organs would be in the set. Um, and then just to show the influence of CD hit, so there are many fewer duplicate genes after running that. So from here, I uh, detected open reading flames and, used, and identified single copy orthologs that were pregnant, present in all six of my species. You want to use single copy orthologs or one-to-one -one paralogs to do selection analyses so that you are not, in fact, comparing different paralogs in this situation. And then I aligned these single copy orthologs and quality checked using MAP <coughs> through Guidance 2. And then panel analysis. So I did two uh, different types of selection analyses here. The first is a branch uh, a style analysis where you look at increased DNDS or the ratio of non synonymous to synonymous uh, substitutions along branches and ask whether or not they're, uh, they're increased along the branches of interest. So I did a test where I first looked at increased DNDS along all desert lineages compared to all non desert lineages. I also looked at all of the species individually and then comparisons of these. The second test I did was looking at uh, selection on specific sites or codons within each of the branches and did a similar sort of setup there. So what did I find? I found that there are 39 genes under selection in all three desert lineages um, using the branch test. And these are enriched for sort of an assortment of phenotypes. Almost all of these are immune phenotypes, which is not necessarily surprising since immune genes as well as reproduction genes are some of the fastest evolving genes. Uh, nothing here on kidney or asthma regulation more generally. Occipital bone morphology? I don't know. Something could be in there. <laughs> um, but one of the cool genes in here is FAT4. So this is FAT atypical CADGAR4. There are a ton of phenotypes associated with this in mouse um, involving kidney morphology. And this is a cool gene because it's involved in really early kidney development. So it's known to, in kidney diseases to disrupt, uh, known in human kidney disease uh, to disrupt development. And also you can see here, so this is sort of a schematic <coughs> pathway, that it associates with RET, which is a tyrosine kinase receptor, right at the uteric bud formation. Um, and knockouts of FAT4 cause duplications of structures in kidneys in house mice. So something essential in early development of kidneys. <coughs> Um, there's also, there are no enrichments in the branch site test, which is unsurprising considering the low number of genes that had a significant hit in the branch site test in all three desert mice. Um, but a cool gene uh, that I sort of pulled out of this that needs more exploring is coro 2 b which is involved in renal glomerulus morphology and urine protein level. But to get on to the expression level data, so I, again, trimmed my reads. I mapped them with salmon to the transcriptomes. I annotated everything to the MUS RefC database <coughs> and then um, used different di differential expression analysis with DSEQ again. Here is just some overall patterns of this data. What, you, what I want you to take away from this is that all of my samples clustered by species, which is great. It means no pipetting error, no identification <laughs> errors. This is stellar. It also means that we had pretty good quality in the samples that I was worried about. The second cool thing is not only do they group by species, but they group phylogenetically. So the Heteromyidae are together, the Dipotidae are together, and then their most closely related species, the Muridae, are together. So this means that over 70 million years of evolution, we still get a profile in the expression data that is useful in this experiment. And the third thing is that samples differ by habitat type. So you can see that there's, along this second axis here, that there are, um, that there's sort of a directionality to the desert in orange and the non-desert and green um, samples. So not only is this useful because we have a reflection of phylogeny, but we also have a reflection of habitat type. So we can use these genes moving forward. So here's, a, here's the analysis of differential expression. And what uh, this Venn diagram is showing you is genes that are differentially expressed <coughs> within families. So between Mus musculus and Notomys alexis, there are 4,479 genes that are differentially expressed. The same for the Dipotidae and the Heteromyidae. And what we're really interested in is right here, the intersection where there's 654 genes that are differentially expressed in all three comparisons. And while in this subset we didn't have genes that were enriched for any phenotype or go terms, there's, um, we can, this, there might be a different way to think about this. So this is a hard way to look at this, but I hope you'll follow along with me. So this is looking at directionality of all the expression um, 
differential expression variation. And so what we're asking here is in what situations are, is the direction of differential expression the same in all three comparisons, right? So in which situations are they all in the same direction, positive or negative? And from this we get 146 genes for which the directionality is the same in all three. So they're all responding di differently and in the same direction you know, to uh, desert environments. And so within here there's a few cool genes involved in kidney morphology and function, creatinine and sodium concentration, and more. The first is an aquaporin, aquaporin 11. Aquaporins are said to be the plumbing of the cell. Their discovery in 2003 uh, was awarded a Nobel Prize in chemistry. They are really essential um, to water movement throughout the body. These are membrane integrated proteins with a pore in the middle that serves as a channel for water and small solutes. And they're associated with a lot of um, water stress phenotypes in mice. And so this particular one um, is, was sort of recently found. Um, it's localized to the proximal tubule and disruption in this results in kidney malformation. And another gene that's sort of trickier to understand is this solute carrier family 35 member 2D, really <laughs> cleverly named. Um, we have a lot less information on what this might be doing in the kidney. We know that this is a family with over 400 genes. They're all solute carriers. This subfamily in particular works with nucleotides and sugar. Um, and this is the expression profile for it in case you were, uh, so in a situation where, where uh, desert rodents in all three cases are significantly lower expressed than their non-desert counterparts. But excitingly, this one has an overlap with the panel analysis. So not great phenotypes yet, but a, a gene with overlap to the other now. <coughs> so I hope with this, I have convinced you that there are a subset of, of genes under selection in all three desert species that are exciting to think about um, the evolution of complex traits. That overall patterns of expression recapitulate both phylogeny and habitat. A subset of these genes show concurrent patterns of differential expression associated with habitat type, and that there is a small but mighty overlap of these genes, meaning that evolution may be working at both the, the regulatory level and at the nuclear type level in this situation. All right, part two. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk to you about go from 70 million years to about 200 years of evolution and think about what's happening during really rapid evolution in an introduction to a novel environment, the Sonoran Desert. Um, so house mice have invaded the, the Americas in the past two to 400 years associated with Western colonization, and they've invaded almost all available habitats. And you can see that here. These are populations that have been collected and are in the Nachman lab as wild-derived and bred strains from Edmonton, Canada, Tucson, Arizona, upstate New York, Florida, and down here is Manaus, Brazil. And you can see that there is really difference in mean annual, uh, big difference in mean annual precipitation about, from all these populations. And there were two observations that were just made from handling these lab colonies. The first was that most mice, when you pick them up as a, a stress response, they avoid their bladders, they pee all over you. And Tucson mice weren't doing that. So you could pick up a mouse and they wouldn't pee on you. And even when we wanted to collect water from live mice, we were unable, er, sorry, urine from live mice, we were unable to. And the second was we give them big bottles of water and you change out the water fairly regularly, and Tucson mice were drinking less water. The water bottles needed to be changed less often than the other mice. So this sort of motivated, do we think maybe there's local adaptation, even on these relatively short time scales in Tucson? Um, and of course, we found local adaptation in other populations that other great people in the lab are working on. So this sort of led to the question, do mice from Tucson show phenotypic differences associated with desert living? Sort of spoiler, but the answer is yes, which motivates the second question, do desert and non-desert populations <coughs> respond differently to water stress? And that leads to this question about how plastic responses to water stress may have facilitated adaptation mm -hmm. to a low water environment. And in the literature recently, this question keeps coming up, whether or not uh, plasticity may facilitate or hinder adaptation to a new environment. And there seems to be good evidence on both sides of that, including some great work done here by Ammon, Coral, and Rasmus. And so I want to speak to this question a little bit. So first, looking at these five lab lines representing 45 wild-derived inbred lines, uh, not age-matched, 163 individuals. I just asked whether or not water consumed over the course of three days differ between these populations relative to uh, body weight. And so I have mice from all these populations, housed singly for 72 hours, measured the water. Pretty simple experiment. 
And the answer is yes, even not age-matched individuals from a whole bunch of lines show that Tucson mice drink less water than mice from Edmonton, from Brazil, and from Florida. And whether or not this is a need or a preference, there does seem to be a difference. And so I wanted to explore this further. And so I took the lowest average water consumption line from Tucson and the highest average water consumption line from Edmonton to move forward with this. And I first wanted to ask about <coughs> additional evolved differences that may persist in these populations. So if you have wild mice that you take into the lab and you inbreed them between 7, 19 generations as we have here, and they still show differences, that suggests that there is some genetic basis for those differences. So I wanted to explore that. <coughs> the second is using a full sieve paired design, so taking litter mates, I took one and applied them to the treatment group, which is three days without water, and one which, in which they had infinite water. And I asked whether or not there are differences between the Tucson and the Edmonton population. And then I phenotyped them from there. So I extracted their kidneys to look at morphology and gene expression. I also extracted blood to look at some serum solutes. And the first thing I want to show you is that, indeed, when you have age-matched individuals, from a single line. So in this case, single line basically represents a single individual. They're so home, they're so inbred, they're basically on the bag, yes. But we have multiple <laughs> individuals here. Um, you do see that, in fact, relative water consumption is much lower in house mice from Tucson. You also see that over three days of water stress, house mice maintain significantly more weight than mice from the non-desert population. And this is a trend that's seen often over the in the 50s, when they were bringing every mouse, every species of rodent they could into the lab and applying water stress and asking how long they could live without water or how well they maintained without water, this is consistent with those findings that desert rodents maintain more weight over time without access to water. Desert specialists. Um, we find that Edmonton has a significantly larger kidney, which I'm not entirely sure how to interpret. Uh, this doesn't really follow any trends but uh, working on that stuff. And then we sent these kidneys um, to the lab at Davis to be sectioned. And while these data aren't significant, they do show that Tucson mice have a larger renal papilla length rate relative to the cortex thickness. And this is sort of consistent with the finding that relative medullary thickness increases, um, is, is, is much greater in desert rodents. So the papilla, of course, is part of the concentrating mechanism, and you can imagine that it would be uh, longer relative to the other parts of the kidney. Um, I then, I had sent a bunch of blood out to look for a bunch of serum solute levels. So I looked at chlorine, chloride, as well as potassium and sodium. I looked at, and these are measures of dehydration, I looked at serum creatinine, blood urea nitrogen, and total protein, which speaks more to glomerular filtration rate. And uh, there's a lot of biology here I'm not going to get into, but you can see that there are situations in which the evolved differences are, uh, in which there are evolved differences between the populations, as well as differences in reactions to water stress. <coughs> I then looked at uh, gene expression in these animals. So I took five uh, hydrated and five dehydrated mice from both populations for a total of 20 mice um, and sequenced these. I, of course, quality and adapter term these are traumatic. Um, it is nice to work on a model organism because I just uh, uh, mapped these to the genome, the house mouse genome. I looked at, uh, and then I looked at different expressions. <coughs> and I did this in four comparisons. So first I wanted to look at the evolved response, um, look, looking at hydrated Tucson and hydrated Edmonton. So this is the sort of wild type. Um, I then looked at dehydrated Tucson versus dehydrated Edmonton. And then I looked at the plastic responses. So what happens when you dehydrate a Tucson mouse and what happens if you dehydrate an Edmonton mouse? And the first overall pattern I want you to see is that looking at the expression profiles of the top uh, thousand differentially expressed genes, they're first differentiated by population. So that's great. Over the past, with only 200 years of evolution, we're able to still get a signal of different populations here. The second thing is, if you can sort of see at the bottom, these white ones are dehydrated and the blue ones are hydrated. Edmonton groups by dehydrated. So there's an effect on the expression in, by treatment. You don't see this in Tucson. So Tucson is not affected at the expression level by treatment. And another way to see this is if you look at uh, differentially expressed genes, this is a comparison of hydrated versus dehydrated uh, in mice in Edmonton versus Tucson. The first thing is that Edmonton has double the number of differentially expressed <coughs> genes than Edmonton does. And also, not only are, is there many more, but the uh, 
the effect is much greater. So the log fold change is greater between hydrated and dehydrated mice. Um, so Tucson mice have maybe an attenuated response to water stress. They're responding less uh, extremely at, uh, to water stress in the desert. And then within this 225 genes is the shared response to dehydration in these mice. So to get at, to get at that question, um, I first looked at GoTerms, in which you have genes involved in blood pressure regula regulation and clotting. And then in phenotypes, the mouse response to dehydration <coughs> is dehydration. That's pretty great. And also uh, decreased vasodilation and additional blood clotting components. And so to get us more, get deeper into this question, I looked at a weighted gene co-expression analysis to look at uh, co-expression modules that are associated with different parameters of interest. So what this is looking at is if you have uh, individual, if you're looking at gene A and you have individuals 1 through 5 have one expression profile and 6 through 10 have another, and you look at gene B, and again, 1 through 5 have one expression profile and 6 through 10 have another, then these are genes that are co-expressed. And so I compared these genes and you can see the, um, the association is in dark colors in this red-green uh, matrix, sorry, colorblind people. And you can see that there are some modules of interest that have, that are especially of interest because they have um, a, a more associated, um, they're, they're more associated with these uh, parameters of interest like population, treatment, these blood serum uh, parameters, weight loss, kidney weight, and different aspects of water consumption. And of these, this one salmon module um, is especially of interest because at its hub, so hub genes are particularly of interest because they have they're, they're um, related to the most other genes. This one uh, hub gene, APOE, is a very interesting kidney candidate gene. So this is a module that's uh, associated with eight of the nine parameters. So here is expression at APOE, which I'll talk about in a second. This is a gene that's involved in fat metabolism within the body. It transports lipids um, to the lymph system and then the blood. And it plays a role in renal damage protection in a whole bunch of different mouse models. Um, and so in knockout mice, uh, kidney disease is increased, and uh, there's all this association with hyperlipidemic streams in which strains, sorry, in which uh, glomerular morphology is differed in knockout mice. And what's also really cool about this is if you look at the expression profile, <laughs> so this is a reaction norm where I'm showing you expression of hydrated Edmonton versus dehydrated mice, dehydrated <coughs> Edmonton versus hydrated Edmonton versus Tucson mice, dehydrated Edmonton versus Tucson mice, you can see both that there is an evolved difference in these populations, but also that the stress response recapitulates the constitutive wild expression in Tucson of, the, of this gene. And so this sort of speaks to the question that I was talking about earlier about adaptive plasticity. So to just give you a framework, we've talked about this a lot in a frequency seminar recently, but um, that to sort of interpret this next slide, um, what I'm, map what I'm plotting here is plastic divergence in gene expression, so Edmonton dehydrated versus hydrated mice, and comparing that with evolved divergence in gene expression, Tucson um, mice versus Edmonton mice, both of those are hydrated. And you can imagine that genes that fall in this category, in which they're either both in the, in, both in the same direction, either positive or negative, might be genes that are involved in adaptation. Whereas genes that go in different directions, uh, in this quadrant or this quadrant, might be non-adaptive. And so if you look in our data, um, you see that the vast majority, 87% of these genes, fall in the quadrants that are associated with adaptive evolution. And to show this in a different way, uh, 416 genes show dehydrated uh, in dehydrated Edmonton mice show shifts in the direction of Tucson expression. So that's pretty cool. And in this category is a whole bunch of interesting genes. I'm just going to highlight aquaporin 2. Again, another aquaporin we found in this system. This is uh, a lot of people's favorite aquaporin, it seems like. Um, it's the only aquaporin regulated by vasopressin. It reabsorbs water um, from urine while being removed from the blood by the kidney, and it's expressed here in the collecting duct. And again, this shows a pretty cool pattern of expression where there's no difference in um, expression level in Tucson mice when exposed to water stress. But again, the, dehyd the dehydrated Edmonton mice recapitulate the expression level of the um, hydrated Tucson mice. 
I went a lot faster than I thought I would. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so to sum this up, we found that house mice show morphological, physiological, and expression level differences associated with desert living, maybe desert adaptive. Mice respond differently to water stress dependent on population of origin. So desert mice show an attenuated response to water stress than non-desert mice do. And that there is evidence for plasticity for water stress, which may have facilitated invasion to this environment. And, be, and this is associated with some exciting genes of interest with which to follow up on. Now just to talk about this uh, plasticity question a little, um, water stress, so the reason we might be thinking about whether or not there is um, a faculty facilitated or, or hindrance to water stress that plasticity might um, apply, yeah, is that um, it might have a lot to do with the phenotype of interest. So you can imagine that throughout the course of every organism's life, they're going through <coughs> water stress, um, even at the, you know, at the hour level, at the day level, and maybe at the multi-day level. I am really dehydrated right now. I am probably <laughs> physiologically responding to that. Um, and so you can imagine that mice are responding to water stress all the time, and they might have sort of a system to deal with this. Whereas something like invasion to a novel environment with new predators might not be something that they have a plastic response to. And so whether or not something is adaptive or plastic has a lot to do with whether or not the gene um, responds in a direction that is useful or a direction that is not useful during that early um, invasion to a new environment. So that might have to, that might speak to why water stress is adaptive in this situation. Plastic. Yeah. And so to wrap this up, I hope I've convinced you that uh, this is, we, I've used two different methods here to get at complex traits, both looking at really deep time scales and really narrow time scales, and we've been able to identify some really exciting candidate genes of interest um, that are able to be followed up on. And with that, I would like to thank a whole lot of people. Um, it takes a village, it turns out, to get a PhD. So uh, this is a picture, September 23rd, 2009, the day I met Michael, that was when I was interviewing to be a lab tech. Um, this is most of the lab that traveled with us from Tucson. We all went to Katya's wedding. This is one of many Thanksgivings. Um, I want to just highlight a few people in the lab that have really helped me out over the years. So the postdocs in the lab when I joined, Megan Pfeiffer, Rixie, and Holly Campbell, were really essential in kind of showing me the lay of the land. And they're really great. They should taught me a lot about rigorous science, about being excited about science, and about um, thinking deeply about evolution. I want to thank Taichi, who um, was just a great friend and companion and co-mouse catcher. Um, he is a great scientist. He's a very uh, creative thinker, which is always great, a very supportive person. Um, when we went out to catch Zapis, I wasn't sure we were going to catch any Zapis because I'd never encountered a Zapis. And Taichi just could not tone down the enthusiasm. <laughs> he was like, well, I love trapping. I love waking up in the morning and trapping because it's like Christmas. You don't know what you're going to find. <laughs> and that is a great person to have out in the field with you. And then, of course, Katya, who is uh, the co-author of most of these papers. She's a fantastic friend, the best science buddy anyone could ever ask for. Uh, and a lot of this work wouldn't have gotten done without her support. I also miss a picture. Um, I want to thank Andrew Rush, who told me as soon as I got here to teach 104. I never heard of 104, I didn't know what 104 was, but it turns out that 104 is really the foundational, one of the foundational experiences I've had at Cal, and I got to teach with some really incredible people. This is Luke, this is Phil with his long hair, <laughs> Dave Armitage pulling a leopard shark out of the aquatic park, I wouldn't recommend that, um, of course, uh, Jim and Rory and Alan and everyone else I've taught with. Um, teaching with them, they're incredible teachers. It's taught me a lot, and also just like contagious energy for natural history enthusiasm, <laughs> and being able to share that with students, thinking about teaching natural history, critical thinking, and all those things have really been a huge part of my experience here. All my uh, non-science friends, I have some non-science friends too, <laughs> um, who have put up with me talking about weird desert mice a lot and only give me some weird looks, uh, especially my family. This is my sister getting a master's at Oxford last year, which was really exciting. I had to visit with her. Um, and then thank you to my committee, of course to Michael, who has been my advisor for all these years. Um, he is just an incredible example of how to be a great scientist, a rigorous scientist. Um, he was the first person who put a kangaroo rat and a jerboa down in front of me, and my mind was blown, and I just sort of all of a sudden thought about, never stopped thinking about convergent evolution after that. Jim Patton, who helped with 
many uh, mouse questions. Lydia, of course, without whom none of this genetic work could be done. KB, also without whom much of this couldn't be done. And Elena, uh, a lot of people were involved in sample acquisition, both who collected for me and who came with me to collect. And then just so many other people. And of course, the current incarnation of the Nathan Lab. I appreciate you all. Thank you. blood serum stuff, mm -hmm. it looked like there was an increase in chloride concentration in the Tucson mice, but not in the... Correct. Um, yeah, so there is, um, oh no, there's a, there's a little star up here. <laughs> there are differences in both of these. <laughs> Could be that layer. Uh, yeah. To a follow-up question. Um, well, I was just, yeah. And did you look at plasma overall plasma osmolality? We didn't, and nor did we look at um, <coughs> urine osmolality, and that's because I wasn't able to get urine out of these mice, especially the dehydrated mice. And also, uh, I, I, you know, there's sort of caveats to to all of these um, parameters because when once you dehydrate a mouse pretty substantially, their blood turns to sludge. And so um, a lot of these parameters increase um, associated with that, and I don't know if I had a great handle on um, standardizing across yeah. that. Yeah, it's interesting that it increases at all. Most vertebrates are supposed to tightly regulate the level of plasma, well, overall plasma osmolality, but especially chloride. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting to see if they, the desert mice show increased tolerance of plasma solutes. Yeah. What what's the cost of being leaky in this case? So, like I understand why it'd be beneficial um, to retain more water, but why do the non-desert adapted mice why are they so profligate with their water, with their urine production? Right. I I think there's like a lot of answers to that, probably having to do with um, you know the cost associated with like you're saying here, any sort of increase in solute concentration, both in the urine and, and the blood. Like, do you think um, that's like energy, like metabolic joules that's required to actually retain that water or like produce the aquaporins or? Yeah. Because yeah. they're not, aquaporins aren't ATP, like they don't, right? They don't need ATP to function. Right, right. yeah, they're just. Changing. So, yeah, just sort of thinking about what that trade off is. Yeah. The sodium chloride transporters do require ATP. <laughs> but I guess it seems yeah. a lot of it was like water related though, which it seems more passive. Or yeah, but the sodium chloride ATPases are still building up the sodium gradient within the medulla. And then the aquaporins are more passively transporting water back into the system as it goes down the collecting duct. Sorry. <laughs> 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 Other questions? All right, well, if not, uh, let's thank Noel, and we're going to have cake and bubbly. Right here.